Hello, um, everybody. A very good, good afternoon, good morning, good evening uh, to to all of you, depending uh, on the timeline you're you're in. My name is Fabrizio. I'm the uh, advisor to the Secretary General, um, and to my team and I have been working on coordinating the roadmap for on digital technology that was launched today. We're very grateful to have you with us. We're just on standby uh, for the Secretary General, who will open this session, but who is caught up in another uh, meeting um, and so is slightly um, delayed. Uh, let me just say uh, a few words. We have a very distinguished um, lineup of, of speakers uh, today, um, and we will also have the opportunity uh, for many of you to, to make statements and, and questions. Of course, like all these events, um, it all seems to be boiled down to the very sophisticated digital skill of managing the mute and unmute uh, button. And I would ask for your uh, indulgence in, in, in helping us get that, get that right. Um, before the Secretary General joins us, I can perhaps say a little two words of, of background. This uh, roadmap that is being launched uh, today is the subject of really literally years of consultation. Um, the, the initiative for the UN uh, to get more involved in trying to become a platform for multi-stakeholder discussions on um, new technologies, and in particular, uh, digital technologies, which are not only transforming the way uh, we, we do business and providing us with instruments that we did not have uh, before, but also transforming the world in ways that has a very direct impact of the mandates that are at the heart of UN endeavors, transforming peace and security, transforming the enjoyment of human rights, transforming access to human development. And it was against that background that there were discussions that dated back literally three years um, that member states, um, a series of people from industry, from academia, uh, from civil society, sought for the Secretary General to have a greater role in proposing to the community, to the global community, how we can um, um, how we can better come together to s maximize the benefits we draw from these technologies while doing better at curtailing the harm. And so the Secretary General, based on um, the uh, initiative of a number of member states and others, uh, had a high-level panel under Jack Ma, Melinda Gates, but with people from 22 other countries and very varied backgrounds um, and age groups. Um, and then we had another round of a long round, intense round of discussions on, um, on what the, the, the high level panel recommendations. And that led to the formulation of the roadmap that we released um, today. So without further ado, those were my two words on background. Um, I would like to, to give the, the floor to, to um, uh, our Secretary General, uh, Antonio Guterres, um, for some opening remarks. We are very uh, fortunate that the Secretary General will be able to stay with us for about uh, 30 minutes. So, uh, Mr. Secretary General, if I could, if I could hand you the, the floor, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Excellencies, distinguished participants, dear friends. The world is shifting from analog to digital technology at a faster pace than we could ever have predicted. This creates both vast promise and some peril. The COVID pandemic has magnified the many benefits and harms of the digital world. Technology is enabling the life-saving work of healthcare providers, allowing businesses to operate remotely, educating our children and connecting us with friends and family. But we also have seen technology gravely misused. Hate speech, discrimination and abuse are on the march in digital spaces. 
Misinformation campaigns put health and lives at risk. In response, the United Nations has launched a verified initiative to increase the volume and reach of accurate information on the crisis. Life-threatening cyber attacks on hospital systems threaten to disrupt life-saving care. We are at a critical point for technology governance. Digital connectivity is indispensable, both to overcome the pandemic and for a sustainable and inclusive recovery, but we cannot let technology trends get ahead of our ability to steer them and protect the public good. If we do not come together now around using digital technology for good, we will lose a significant opportunity to manage its impact, and we could see further fragmentation of the internet to the detriment of all. Excellencies, dear friends, this is the backdrop to the roadmap for digital cooperation that we are launching today. The roadmap is a guide for a multilateral, multi-stakeholder way forward in the age of digital in interdependence. Building on the report of the high-level panel on digital cooperation, it sets out eight areas where we can come together and pursue the imperative for global action on digital cooperation. The overriding aim of the roadmap is to connect, respect and protect people in the digital age. The United Nations will be a facilitator in the platform, mobilizing partnerships and coalitions between governments, citizens, civil society, academia and industry. This diverse panel of distinguished speakers exemplifies the inclusive approach we need. Allow me to suggest what some of the first steps could be. First, on universal connectivity. We must convene leaders in connectivity to establish baselines, targets and metrics for connectivity and affordability and then to support emerging efforts and develop new financing models. Together, we can achieve the target of ensuring that every person has safe and affordable access to the internet by 2030. Second, digital public goods. We need a concerted effort, a global effort from member states, the UN system, private sectors and others to promote open source software, open data, open AI models, open standards and open content that are there to privacy, applicable laws, and do no harm. This is a vast potential to help us achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. Third, digital inclusion efforts that reach all, including the most vulnerable. The proposed Digital Inclusion Coalition will help develop metrics and scorecards to accelerate an inclusive digital ecosystem that addresses the growing digital gender gap and reaches the most vulnerable including migrants, refugees, and others. Fourth, digital capacity building through expanded training programs and support. The United Nations system stands ready to work with national governments on efforts to meet these global needs, which will require greater coherence and coordination. Fifth, digital human rights. The roadmap addresses issues including data protection and privacy, digital identities, surveillance technology, as well as online harassment and abuse. It calls for human rights to be put at the center of regulatory frameworks and legislation on the development and use of digital technologies. Six, artificial intelligence, an area that poses some of the greatest challenges to ethics, policy and governance. We need to ensure that all perspectives, particularly those of developing countries, are part of the conversation. The roadmap offers the United Nations as a platform to strengthen global cooperation on AI so that it is trustworthy, human rights-based, sustainable and safe, and promotes peace. Seventh, digital trust and security. The international community must come together at the highest levels to prioritize and safeguard the digital technologies that underpin core social functions and critical infrastructure, such as access to food, water, housing, energy, healthcare, and transportation. I urge you to continue exploring the value of a universal statement which acknowledges the strong linkage between the principles of digital trust and security and our ability to realize the 2030 agenda. Finally, global digital cooperation. I will work with all of you to implement the proposals to enhance the Internet's Internet Governance Forum so that it can guide efforts to build a more effective architecture for digital cooperation. I also intend to appoint an envoy on technology to push forward the United Nations work on this issue. Excellencies, dear friends, today's digital landscape offers us an opportunity, but if we don't take that opportunity, it could quickly turn into a threat. 
unless we address digital instability and inequality, they will continue to exacerbate physical instability and inequality. We will risk the physical and economic health of people and infrastructure as digital divides become the new face of insecurity and conflict. We cannot afford that to happen. I urge you to be unserving in your commitment to connect, respect, and protect people in the digital way, in the digital age. And I encourage you to take bold, broad, innovative, and collective action. The greatest risk we face is not that we will go too far, is that we will go not far enough. The United Nations cannot solve these problems alone, and I thank you for your commitment and your support. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Secretary General. Um, we now uh, are fortunate to be able to hear a statement from Her Excellency Simonetta Samaruga, the President of the Swiss Confederation. Your Excellency, Mr. Under Secretary General, Excellencies. In some ways, the corona crisis has worked like a magnifying glass. The essential has become clearer. We saw how important it is to have access to trustworthy information and how important independent journalism is for citizens, given the spread of misinformation online. The crisis has also acted as an accelerator for digitalization. In only a few months, Many of us have learned to deal with online conferences, homeschooling, and other digital tools that many have not been using before. We know that technology in itself is neutral. Whether its effects are good or bad depends on the intentions of the people using it. Good intentions open up many opportunities to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Digitalization not only offers useful tools to combat the spread of the coronavirus and mitigate against its economic impact, digital tools are also used in the fight against global warming. Smart technology can save energy and avoid wasting resources. In agriculture, technology can help to detect disasters at an early stage. Unfortunately, there are other intentions. Some collect data to gain power and control over people. Others think about using robots to kill people in conflicts. Cybercriminals attack and blackmail institutions like hospitals and thus threaten the life of people. Our open, free and constructive public sphere is under threat when some governments or internet giants control what information we see, know which newspapers we read, and what friends we have. In this way, these actors can exert an enormous influence on our democracies. At the same time, it is getting increasingly difficult for smaller and poorer states and societies to defend their freedom and independence. In our view, Digitalization must be put at the service of all people. To achieve this, we need to develop a minimal set of rules for the digital world. As our interests and visions may differ, this is not an easy or quick task. But there is no alternative. We need to preserve a free and secure digital space for our children, and we need to make sure that all have access to it. This is not the case today. Even in rich countries like Switzerland, some children had to be connected to the internet before they could participate in homeschooling during the corona lockdown. So, what do we need to do today? 15 years ago, at the World Summit on the Information Society, we agreed to create a space for dialogue among all relevant stakeholders, governments, parliaments, businesses, civil society and academia. 
and we created the UN Internet Governance Forum, a platform for dialogue, open to everybody. Today, such dialogue is still necessary, but it is no longer sufficient. We need to go one step further and develop a space where we can define shared rules. Last year's recommendations of the high-level panel on digital cooperation have been an important milestone, and the UN Secretary-General's roadmap, as presented today, offers an important next step towards more inclusive digital cooperation and governance. Given that it is easier to build an existing, on existing mechanisms rather than to agree on creating something new, we are convinced that the model Internet Governance Forum Plus will have the best chance to bring us the next step ahead. For the last 20 years, Switzerland has been actively supporting the development of digital cooperation and governance. My former Federal Council colleague, Mrs. Doris Leuthard had the privilege of contributing to these discussions as a member of the high-level panel. We are fully committed to continue to work with all of you. Also, international Geneva. Okay, thank you. Um, I think um, I'm afraid we might have uh, cut short due to a technical problem, the video transmission from the, the, the president um, of the Swiss Federation. Um, but we're very grateful uh, for her contribution. And I now have the honor to, to welcome um, His Excellency, the President of Sierra Leone, uh, Mr. Julius Mada Bio. Uh, Your Excellency, the, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon from Freetown, Sierra Leone. Let me start by thanking His Excellency, Mr. Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, for his invitation and acknowledgement of my country's deep investment in innovation and technology. We are also grateful for his recognition that although we are a small country, our vision is firmly embedded in a wider global vision of digital cooperation. In Sierra Leone, we are wrestling with challenges that are not unique to other countries in Africa. We are working to develop our digital infrastructure and connectivity. And we believe that with this, we can further enhance digital penetration. So in the last one year, we have increased mobile cell phone penetration by 7.6% to 87%. And we have increased internet penetration by 8.1% to 25%. Over the last one year, we have expanded the capacity of the national fiber optic backbone from one gigabyte to 10 gigabytes. And this has led to an increase in the use of national fiber network by mobile network operators, internet providers, and ministries, departments, and agencies. We have completed five kilometer cable from the Sarkab cable landing station at Bintumani. That has further strengthened the, the network. I am also pleased to announce that the network is now fully managed by SACA, which is a local team. We will build on this over the coming years as we seek to roll out National Fiber Backbone Phase 2 that will cover 14 new towns. 
We have finalized the e-governance network, and we are making tremendous progress on network architecture as a whole. We are still contending with low levels of digital literacy across the country, especially in non-urban areas. And we are mindful of the persistent threat of cyber security. But that, to my mind, is the reason that for such international engagements to team and discourse, to learn and discourse best practices and solidify cooperation agreements and productive partnerships that we have our small countries deal with these challenges. But even before becoming the president, I was firmly focused on leveraging digitalization, science, technology, and innovation for national development. My arguments are simple. First, our world is heavily interconnected by information and communication technologies and digital citizenship must be inclusive, both within and across borders. Secondly, we believe technology is an accelerator of development. Various digital technologies can drive various sustainable development goals, especially in view of limited and unequal progress in most of our nations towards achieving SDGs. Especially, we believe that by harnessing the advantages of Goal 9, industry, innovation, and infrastructure, we can make significant progress on delivering, measuring, and optimizing on other goals from education, entrepreneurship, agriculture, healthcare, transportation, and even more. We also believe that a digitally enabled government is a more efficient government. We can eliminate time and process inefficiencies, corruption and red tape, and other service delivery inefficiencies that have held back development in our country. But there is a bigger imperative that for Sierra Leone to participate, and that is for Sierra Leone to participate fully in the future global economy and the fourth industrial revolution. Sierra Leone needs a clear, nimble strategy for using innovation, technology, and digitization for inclusive development. Our aspiration, therefore, as a nation is not only to be digitally inclusive in compliance with international and regional guidelines, but to use innovation and digitalization both as a solution and as a critical driver for efficient governance and national development. So upon assuming office, one of my first decisions was to establish the Directorate of Science, Technology, and Innovation in the office of the president. I appointed the first chief innovation officer to drive our key initiatives and foster productive relationships on digital cooperation within the last 18 months. Digital cooperation. And within the last 18 months, we have made tremendous progress. We launched a national innovation and digitization strategy as an overarching document. Embedded within that strategy are three key clusters, digital governance, digital identity, and digital economy. We have also ensured that development planning and policy making, policy making resource allocation, monitoring, and evaluation are driven by accurate and relevant data. Often, we render complex data as 3D models. We have created various up-to-date comprehensive and geo-referenced data hubs that are central to key government priorities in the areas of education, the economy, healthcare, access to justice, among others. We are also increasingly using digital technology and innovation for automating governance processes, budget processes, revenue collection, etc. These technology mediated processes are more effective and more transparent and more streamlined. We are also using science, 
innovation and technology in the areas of resource governance with a view to bringing more sanity and transparency in the sector. We have recently completed a national airborne geophysical survey through which we have acquired high resolution, high precision data sets that we use, that will be used to drive the development of this sector. By automating processes, we are making it easier to register, act, and do business in Sierra Leone. We are also using forms of digitalization to support entrepreneurship and business. The basis of our of an inclusive digital economy is a national digital identity platform. This is based off a biometric permanent civil registry. We have strengthened our civil registration and vital statistics systems through partnership with Kiva and the UN. Sierra Leone developed the first blockchain digital ID platform in Africa. This will enhance financial inclusion, public safety, service access, and delivery right across the board when fully implemented. We are eager to also explore new technologies and new possibilities. Our drone corridor project that we launched last year in collaboration with UNICEF we put new technologies to the service of our development aspirations. Drones will support everything from healthcare, especially maternal health, agriculture, food, pro food production, the environment, by monitoring green cover loss, education, and more. We recognize that to take full advantage of all these opportunities and possibilities, we must enhance digital literacy in schools. My government supports free quality, basic edu secondary education, basic and secondary education for all Sierra Leoneans, Sierra Leonean children with up to 21% of our national budget. Government also supports STEM education in higher education and uh, TVET. There is more planned internet connectivity to schools and we will soon convene a national forum for the future of education in Sierra Leone. We have deployed homegrown technology solutions to support the Ministry of Health and emergency operation centers in the fight against COVID-19 pandemic. From health information systems, a situation room for real-time data on disease management and surveillance and e-passes for regulating inter-district travel restrictions. But Sierra Leone has also concluded a number of international partnerships. We are part of such larger global initiatives as Grade 3, a geo-reference infrastructure and demographic data for development initiatives that make it possible to leverage state-of-the-art data science, remote sensing, and data collection technology to make predictions about population distribution. We also have active, active part, uh, partnerships with, among others, Estonia, South Africa, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Microsoft, MIT, Harvard, Yale, UNICEF, Kiva, that continue to enrich and enhance our national innovation vision. We are looking to explore new possibilities. We are already using open source technologies, data models, and other contents that are committed to making our data sets and homegrown technology solutions open. We are open to partnerships and cooperation in the overcoming challenges of infrastructure and inclusion high, uh, highlighted at the beginning of this presentation. Our vision can be summed up in the phrase, country as lab, for science, technology, and innovation. A country eager to cooperate in digital technologies that we drive our development as a nation. On this note, I thank you again, Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for providing leadership on a roadmap for digital cooperation.
This will make our world and the future of our nation even better. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Excellency, for, for, for sharing your very rich and progressive national practice uh, with us. It's an honor that the UN is able to contribute to all the innovation you, you are pursuing in such an exemplary manner. And thank you so much for joining us today. I must take the opportunity again to apologize that the uh, video message of the President of Switzerland uh, was cut short by a few seconds due to a technical a mishap. We will make the full version of that video available um, on, on our website. And again, I apologize for that. And now uh, I have the honor to move on with a message uh, from His Highness Sheikh Hamdan bin Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, the Crown Prince of Dubai and Chairman of the Executive Council of Dubai. Um, so the floor will now be given to a message from His Highness. Your Excellency, Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to start by congratulating the United Nations, led by Your Excellency, on the launch of the Roadmap on Digital Cooperation. This important initiative will increase cooperation between governments and encourage support for the private sector, international organizations, and individuals around the world. United Arab Emirates is fully committed to any initiative that increases global dialogues and is a keen supporter of the United Nations. I would also like to express my solidarity of those suffering from the health, social, and economic impact of COVID-19. And to the families of those who have lost their lives because of this global pandemic. In the last three months, the world has witnessed a phase in history that will be discussed in history books. We have witnessed tremendous challenge and vast progress at the same time. And we have all seen the problem of not making our government's system and policies agile and ready for any upcoming disruption, whether it's good or bad. One lesson that I would like to share with you all today is the importance of investing for the future, investing for what is to come, not what is already here. The government of United Arab Emirates, under the leadership of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, has invested for 20 continuous years, which enabled us to continue operations 100% in the public sector with virtual work measures. The pandemic has also highlighted to all of us that we must not operate in isolation, that no country is better off on its own. If there were a time that we needed to focus on building bigger, stronger, and more resilient bridges, it is today. There are still many opportunities for us to push forward digital cooperations. More than 46% of the world is still offline, and we need to accelerate the effort needed to connect nearly half of the world. Through this pandemic, we have seen that it is possible for us to accelerate the progress of any issue or task. Governments globally pushed three years' worth of development to be done in the past three months, so we know that it is possible. We are also seeing the beginning of new challenges and new conflicts, ones that will never seen in the physical world until after the damage is done. 
I would like to conclude by sharing a model of thinking that we use in Dubai. One that is even more relevant today for every individual organization and government. In the UAE, we are committed to always disrupting ourselves and have a thought process that always requires us to shape the future today. We know that disruption is coming and the need of accelerate our development ensures that we keep moving forward and that we leave no one behind. On behalf of the people of the United Arab Emirates, we welcome the United Nations efforts on bringing the international community together for a better future. Stay safe, and I look forward to seeing Thank you, um, your, your, uh, your Highness, um, for those very inspiring um, remarks. Um, I will now give the floor to Mr. Uh, Klaus Schwab um, of the Executive Chairman of the World Economic Forum. Thank you for this opportunity to address this, this community, community at this very important meeting. We, the World Economic Forum, greatly welcome the launch of this roadmap and share with Secretary General Guterres and Special Advisor Hochschild the feeling of great urgency for increased and improved global cooperation. COVID-19 has irrevocably changed our world. So many of us had to learn how to live differently, to learn how to work, socialize, shop, and collaborate differently. And we are doing all of this online. Since the onset of the corona crisis, Internet usage has increased by 70%. The use of communication apps has increased by 300%. And virtual collaboration tools by 600%. And some video streaming services have grown 20-fold. This is only true for those who are connected to the Internet. However, today, 30 years after the invention of the World Wide Web by Sir Tim Berners-Lee, this stands at just 53% of the world's population. Many individuals and populations in emerging economies around the world are now facing the impact of COVID-19 without the benefit of the connectivity that all of us take so much for granted. Of the 25 least connected countries in the world, 21 are in Africa. And the gap between those who are connected and those who are not is so dramatically felt today. The World Economic Forum developed the Joint Action Plan together with the ITU, the World Bank, GSMA, and our industry partners. It highlights key immediate actions for private-public collaboration to ensure that digital connectivity is available and expanded to those who need it most. This has already been shared with 170 countries and is in active use. This fast-track partnership is deeply encouraging. A number of our partners have highlighted that we have made more progress in the last four months than in the last 10 years. Technology has been a critical weapon also in our fight against COVID. In April, the World Economic Forum established the COVID Digital Response Network, which has already compiled a compendium of over 90 lighthouse examples of how technology can be used 
to respond to the COVID crisis. In the Great Reset process, the Forum is undertaking to shape the post-corona era. We have to pay also special attention to the SMEs, small businesses which make up 40 to 90 percent of GDP in economies around the world are facing today a struggle for survival. The ability for small businesses to have access not just to affordable quality connectivity but to common digital services such as digital identity, security and digital financial tools which will be critical to their success. The ability of this community of small and medium-sized businesses to secure their livelihoods will have a tremendous impact on social resilience and cohesion in every country. As we advance our collaboration and establish our shared global priorities and roadmaps, I offer you five thoughts to guide our collective efforts. First, we must be ambitious the time for incremental change and growth of digital access is over. We must highlight the critical nature of this challenge as foundational to so many others. And we have to bring those who care about education, health, climate, equality and growth to also be the champions in our mission to bring connectivity to all. Second. We must invest in digital inclusion with innovative financing models. Currently, only 1% of funding from multinational development banks goes towards digital infrastructure. Third, we must think of digital infrastructure and digital inclusion holistically, including digital identity and payment solutions as much as simple connectivity. Fourth, Success will only be possible through deep, sustained cross-industry and private-public partnership to ensure both affordability for consumers as well as sustainable economic and fiscal models for continued service provision. And finally, fifth, we should be guided by core principles for our shared digital future, inclusion, trust and sustainability. It is clear that the COVID-19 crisis is a watershed moment for digital infrastructure and services. Digital is the fabric of our post-COVID lives and we will continue to rely on technology more and more unless we rapidly tackle the challenge to bring high quality universal internet access to all we will not be able to build inclusive economies or achieve our society. Thank you. I'd like to thank the World Economic Forum for that statement uh, for us from their executive chairman, Mr. Klaus Schwab, Professor Klaus Schwab. And now uh, we have the, the profound honor to welcome with us Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web, co-founder of the Web Foundation, and Chief Technical uh, Officer of Inrupt uh, to speak. Um, so over to you, um, Sir Berners-Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Fabrizio. Secretary General, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you for this opportunity uh, to join this discu uh, discussion. I'd particularly like to acknowledge the many people who are watching and listen listening to this around the world through the World Wide Web. I would like to congratulate the Secretary General for an excellent roadmap, which I'm looking forward to discussing in the future. We meet, of course, thanks to digital technology at a time when meeting physically has not been possible. The web has been a lifeline for so many people during this crisis, enabling work, education, and social, inter and social connections. But we've also seen the impacts of gross inequality. So almost half the world 
3.5 billion people remain unable to connect. Our number one focus, then, as we discuss digital cooperation, must be to close the digital divide. Digital inequality is a barrier to wider equality, and we know it most affects those who are already marginalized, people in developing countries, those on low incomes, and of course, women and girls. Men remain 21% more likely than women to be online, and 52% more likely in the least developing countries. And women and men alike, progress is too slow. This year's Sustainable Development Goal 9C for universal access was a good target, but we are going to miss it by a long way. Only through enhanced cooperation can we speed up progress and get everyone connected. To really tackle digital inequality, we must raise the bar beyond basic access to ensure people have meaningful connectivity, which is the Alliance for the Affordable Internet recommends it must include data, speed, and devices to use the full power of internet. When people do get online, we also want them to find a web that is safe and empowering. We all know that this is not always the case. For instance, the problem of online gender-based violence is growing and must be addressed. For women of color, the threat is even more pervasive. As we connect everyone, we must always steer the technology, as you said, Secretary General, for positive change, towards positive change. My organization, the Web Foundation, has worked with the other stakeholders to develop this roadmap for digital cooperation. Last year, we also launched our own Contract for the Web, a global plan of action for governments, com governments co companies, and civil society to deliver the web we want for everyone. And I'm pleased to see that the roadmap highlights the contract of the web as one of the important multi-stakeholder efforts for addressing rising threats in the online world. So far, 1,300 organizations have endorsed the uh, contract for the web. We are currently developing ways for contract endorsers governments and companies especially, to demonstrate how they are actually living up to the commitments that they've made to achieve a safe and empowering web, connecting the unconnected, respecting privacy, fighting misinformation, and building inclusive technologies. We want to encourage best practices in these areas with governments in a race to the top to develop the best national broadband policies to connect all their citizens and companies competing to combat online gender-based violence. For tech companies in particular, I want to encourage them to build platforms that empower human beings, that redistribute power to individuals and reimagine distributed creativity, distributed collaboration and distributed compassion None of these challenges face can be addressed in isolation. That is why the work of the UN is so important. I encourage member states and all stakeholders to embrace the contract for the web, to work together under the umbrella of the UN and of the Roadmap for Digital Cooperation, and focus on a better, fairer, and more inclusive digital future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much uh, for those inspiring words and for your um, work that has inspired us uh, throughout um, our endeavor. Um, I'd now like to hand the floor to Mr. Ajay Banga, the incoming chair of the International Chamber of Commerce and the president uh, and chief executive officer an incoming executive chairman of MasterCard. Uh, Mr. Ajay Banga, you, you have the floor. Sir. Thank you very much, Fabrizio. 
I think over the last few months, the health crisis has disrupted lives, work and trade around the world. And as all of us, businesses, individuals and governments have sought ways to take control over the disruption and move forward. As Tim just said, we have witnessed an enormous leap in the adoption of the web and digital technologies. But like him, we believe that these solutions from virtual classrooms and video chats to digital payments and disbursements, they've played a key role in mitigating the already heavy human and economic toll of the crisis. And I think the Secretary General's roadmap is prescient because while we still cannot fully predict what the new normal will look like, one thing is clear, achieving meaningful universal connectivity will be a vital component of a post-COVID recovery. And none of that will happen if we don't also close the gap between those who have access and the opportunities that come with them and those who do yes. not. So I think we all agree, we must close the digital divide. The first step is to build and provide the digital infrastructure as well as the tools and the capacity to use it, as Tim so eloquently argued. But the next steps, however, are equally important. And the first one to me is to create and implement a universal ID. As His Excellency, the President of Sierra Leone just said, now is the time to change the way people establish identity in both the physical and digital world through transparent, globally interoperable services and data controlled by users. We might build the digital infrastructure, but without a universally recognized form of identification that works online, access to that infrastructure will be locked and people will not be able to get it. We have examples of this. We ourselves in Moscow are piloting one solution of this type with many partners, Microsoft and Samsung, and the Australian government in Australia, or the International Chamber of Commerce has the AOK pass that verifies immunization records and COVID-19 test data without compromising privacy and without sharing personal medical information. A second point here is to redefine the rules for cyber security to create the combinatory effects of layered defenses. Cyber threats pose tremendous and growing risk and there's a critical challenge that could undermine any advancement toward digital inclusion. Now is the time to focus on protecting the entire digital ecosystem and a global population of users rather than discrete parts of the system. Now, this is not a capability we have to build from scratch. As an example, the Cyber Readiness Institute here in the United States is just one program ready to help. It approaches this issue from the position of helping one of the weakest links in the chain, small businesses, with the tools they need to be cyber ready. Our goal here has to be one that brings these efforts together in ways that protect the entire system. And third, to develop policy and regulations that support innovation and collaboration. Digital innovation, insight-driven evolution, and overall growth require a flow of information. We have to ensure that while we are protecting our countries, people, and the system, we are also not restricting them or hampering the ability to actually use digital technologies to connect with the opportunities around them. For example, the imperative right now is to expedite completion of a new global framework of rules governing e-commerce under the auspices of the WTO. In the next two to three years, the continued deployment of 5G and the proliferation of IoT with the expansion of cloud and edge technology and the explosion of artificial intelligence will no doubt have tremendous impact on the ways we conduct business, educate our youth, and secure our borders, both physical and virtual. But I said this earlier, we cannot have an internet of everything without the inclusion of everyone. And we will not achieve that unless we work together to build the system, foster use, offer access, protect it, and support its growth. The International Chamber of Commerce, our global network of 45 million businesses in more than 100 countries, we stand ready to do all we can to enable meaningful digital inclusion in the years to come. We know that businesses do not operate in a vacuum, nor can each act alone. Recovering from COVID-19 in a way that to quote the mantra of the SDGs, leaves no one behind, means we all, governments and businesses, large and small, must come together to deliver one 
larger holistic digital collaboration that is greater than the sum of its parts. And therefore, Mr. Secretary General, we are very supportive of your roadmap. We are grateful for your leadership. Count on us. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Banga, for those inspiring and insightful words. I'd now like to give the floor, um, warmly welcome the Chief Executive Officer of Vodafone, uh, Mr. Nick Reed. Uh, Nick, the floor is, is yours. Thank you, Fabrizio, and uh, thank you, uh, Secretary General, for the opportunity uh, to talk today. I will be uh, relatively brief, uh, but I will be echoing a number of the comments uh, made by the speakers uh, already. Vodafone operates in 25 countries throughout Europe and Africa, and we have global partners for the rest of the world. We have a single purpose, which is to connect for a better future. We want to enable a sustainable, inclusive digital society. And so when the crisis happened, we really looked at ourselves and said, our purpose is even more relevant in society moving forward. Now, COVID-19 taught a very difficult yet essential lesson, particularly the vital role played by telecoms and digital, digital applications, uh, infrastructure in maintaining a fully functioning society and economy in a very difficult period. At a human level, telecoms and digital applications enabled us to connect critically new hospitals uh, in record times and allowed us to support the health system more broadly. It allowed education to be delivered to living rooms. It allowed businesses to operate from laptops on tabletops. So it had a really key role to play to keep the economy going and society going. But that shift to digital was sadly not universal. COVID shone a very harsh light on the digital divide and inequalities that exist in our society. There were children that did not get education. There's businesses that are facing bankruptcy, many small enterprises, and the elderly remain isolated in their communities. We have to take the opportunity, look to the recovery as a unique opportunity to rebuild our societies more inclusive, more sustainable, more resilient. We need to close that digital divide. Now, this starts with investing in digital infrastructure, increasing the coverage of reliable and affordable connectivity. Today, half the world does not have adequate connectivity. In Africa, half a billion people have coverage but do not use the data services. So in addition to infrastructure, we must invest in demand for digital services. And it covers three pillars. The first is rolling out digital skills development throughout all citizens in the community. Secondly, digitize public services at scale. And I especially would focus at health and education. And the third is close the digital gap for small enterprises. This is really fundamental to improve the overall resilience of the economies uh, throughout the globe. Now, all of these things together will also play a major role in eradicating the 26% gender gap in digital access globally. So to close, achieving a sustainable, inclusive digital society is transformational, but requires us to embrace reform, all of us. It, it requires governments and businesses to be true partners. It requires financial institutions to find new models of sustainable funding for digital infrastructure. And third, it requires policymakers to overcome geopolitical tensions. We must rebuild better more resilient, more inclusive. The roadmap for digital cooperation is crucial for this. And Vodafone stands ready to play its role and be a key partner with everyone in the society. Thank you.
Thank you so much for those very succinct but inspiring uh, words. Uh, I'd now like to, to hand the floor to, to my, my colleague, uh, my very esteemed colleague, um, who is the high representative for the least developed countries, landlocked developing countries and small island developing states. Those who more often than not, are those who suffer most uh, on the wrong end of the digital uh, divide. So, Fekita, if I could hand the floor to you, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary General, Excellency, distinguished moderator and panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to first uh, express my gratitude to Under Secretary General Fabrizio Hochschild for ensuring uh, that the process leading to this roadmap was inclusive. Thank you for enabling the strong engagement from the Global South and especially the least developed countries, landlocked developing countries and small island developing states. They represent 91 countries with a combined population of more than 1 billion. The COVID-19 pandemic and its impact has shown us the urgency to close the digital divide, which is an added dimension of ever-growing inequalities. The Secretary General's roadmap once more alerts us that 87% of individuals in developed countries used the internet in 2019. The access and use in the least developed countries stood at just 19%. In the landlocked developing countries and small island developing states, the figure is also below 50% on average. A large share of people in these countries simply cannot participate in virtual learning. They do not have the means to work from home. Telemedicine is a distant dream and forget about staying connected with their families and friends. They are unable to listen and participate in conversations such as this one. The time is now for us to make the right decisions, take immediate action and implement initiatives. We cannot leave them behind. We need to ensure their effective inclusion and participation in an ever more digitally connected world and humanity. So what uh, can we do to support these vulnerable countries? We need to first get the basics right. We need to do so because we know that to connect digitally with the world is not a luxury, but a precondition to attaining sustainable development and to address climate change. It is now that we must invest in the necessary infrastructure for all. This will require both public funding and international support. The reality remains that very little aid is used for this purpose. Only a small fraction of overseas development assistance is dedicated to digitization. The financing for sustainable development report is clear. Only 1% of project funding by multilateral development banks targeted the information and communications technology sector between 2012 and 2016. This needs to change. Once people have access, there are so many productive ways to use digital technology from basic service provision to rural areas, enhancing financial inclusion and enabling access to e-education, e-health and e-governance. Digital technology is at the core of participating in the global production and value chain. We know that the least developed countries want and need to build their productive base and engage in the global value chain as producers and not just consumers. Yet it is a major challenge, but this is the moment to move a challenge to an opportunity. We here have the privilege of being part of this discussion and privilege means responsibility. We should think about how small companies in LDCs, LLDCs and SIDs and benefit from the digital economy. Getting small firms to benefit is not trivial and we have to think creatively if vulnerable countries are to also benefit from the opportunities that the digital world offers. Now is the time to boost all dimensions of broadband internet access. Availability, accessibility, content and capacity to use, and this must include the least developed countries landlocked developing countries and the small island developing states. Let us move words to action. I thank you.
thank you very much um, for, for, for those words and for that perspective. Uh, I'd now like to give the floor um, to our last panelist, uh, Baroness uh, Joanna Shields, who is the founder of the We Protect Global Alliance and Chief Executive Officer of the Benevolent of Benevolent AI. Uh, Joanna, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hochschild. Your Excellency, Secretary General Guterres, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am grateful for the opportunity to speak about the state of the digital world today and specifically the urgent need to protect children from online abuse and exploitation. What we have experienced as a society in the first months of 2020 has been unprecedented in our lifetimes. As the pandemic raged through our communities and lockdowns were enforced, digital connectivity uplifted us, keeping our friends and families close, our businesses operating, and thankfully, our children occupied. But what you may not be aware of is that during this time, another pandemic was attacking children from within their own homes. Child abuse and online sexual exploitation have exploded during this crisis. The rise of unsupervised screen time, coupled with the normalization of young people sharing sexually explicit images of themselves with strangers has made them vulnerable to predators. It is estimated that at any given moment, there are 750,000 offenders looking to exploit and abuse children online. Moreover, the stress and isolation of COVID-19 has increased the risk of those who have a sexual interest in children to act on their impulses. In the US alone, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children registered a 106% increase in reports of suspected child sexual exploitation. This is on top of the 70 million cases of child abuse material reported in 2019, which represented a nearly 50% increase over 2018. When COVID-19 emerged, we shut down the entire economy to stop it from spreading. We made trade-offs. That's what society does in times of crisis. So why is it that when it comes to the protection of children from online sexual exploitation, a global health emergency in its own right, we don't take equivalent actions? Child sexual material is no longer relegated to the dark corners of the web. Every app and online platform that allows users to post and share images and videos is a recruitment target. Live stream sexual abuse of a child, even infants, can be accessed online for as little as $15. And yet internet platforms and device manufacturers continue to allow criminals to hide behind anonymity and obfuscate their crimes. Regret regrettably, Facebook has announced its intent to deploy end-to-end -end encryption across WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook, and Messenger. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children estimates that, that what will be lost as a result of this action are over 12 million reports of child sexual abuse material. And with it, 12 million cries for help will not be heard. Let me be clear, encryption is a vital tool to protect privacy and security, but children deserve to be safe and their rights must be protected too. We must not give offenders the cover to go undetected and unpunished. A timely announcement that came out today brings a sliver of hope. A group of leading tech giants who in March proclaimed their commitment to voluntary principles have now backed a plan to eradicate child sexual abuse online. But promises have been made before. And if we are to safeguard young lives, we must sustain our scrutiny and ensure that statements of intent and press releases are translated into clear and measurable results. The statistics of this escalating crisis paint a distressing picture, but behind every case is a heartbreaking story of an abused child. I have borne witness to the stories of these children and they will be forever etched in my mind. And just like COVID-19, this pandemic is hitting 
the poorest and most vulnerable parts of our society the hardest. This is a crime that transcends borders. No country or company can tackle it. That is why in 2014, I founded, the we, Prote I founded we Protect to galvanize global attention to this emerging and unthinkable crime against children and to unify stakeholders to act. Two years later, we joined with the US-EU Global Alliance Against Child Abuse Online. And today, the We Protect Global Alliance has 97 countries, leading law enforcement agencies, civil society organizations, and tech companies as members and partners. Together, we built a model national response framework to support all countries in achieving a level of proficiency in fighting this crime. And we also support the emerging online safety community for building and developing innovative solutions that protect children from harm online. We believe that technology in itself is neither good nor evil. It's up to us to make it a powerful ally and to use its transformative power to heal and stop this heinous crime. One of our most valuable partners is the UNICEF and Violence Against Children Global Partnership and Fund. I had the pleasure of launching the EVAC Fund back in um, summertime 2016 and I'm so proud of the work they have done. While We Protect serves as the global coordinator of all stakeholders involved in the fight against child sexual exploitation, the EVAC Fund deploys targeted investments to strengthen national, regional, and global capabilities. Most recently, we aligned in response to COVID-19, and what we accomplished together is a testament to the power of constructive digital collaboration. I am grateful for the acknowledgement of EVAC's work in the UN Secretary General's Roadmap for Digital Cooperation. We are also fortunate to have the support of the European Union, and we welcomed a resolution adopted last November by the European Parliament, calling on all member states to actively support organizations like the We Protect Global Alliance to fight and stop child sexual exploitation online. I come to this forum with over 30 years of tech industry experience having served as a senior executive at Google, Facebook, AOL, and also in government as the UK Minister for Internet Safety and Security. And what I have learned is that technology fused with human intelligence and compassion can help transform society to remake and renew the world. Indeed, at Benevolent AI, where I now serve as CEO, we build technology that harnesses the power of all the world's biomedical data to enable scientists to discover life-changing medicines. In this mission to preserve human health, we hope to transform a broken system of drug discovery and development that is currently leaving too many patients with no hope for a cure. Similarly, as the Secretary General said, we must build technology for good. Purposeful technology is one of the most powerful tools in preventing child sexual abuse and exploitation. As we gather today in celebration of the Roadmap for Digital Cooperation, and in recognition of the power of the international coordinated action, we must simultaneously be mindful that every young life damaged is our collective responsibility. United, we will stop this heinous crime, support and protect survivors, and ensure the digital world is a safe place for all children everywhere to learn without fear, to experience and participate in all that life has to offer. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lady Shields, for, for your, your intervention. Uh, very inspiring. And of course, this is one of the areas where I think the lack of um, governance is most apparent. Of course, the need to get rid of ch anything harmful to children uh, online is is a pretty universally uh, shared value across the world, and yet harmful content to children has multiplied. So there's clearly a deficit there that we cannot explain away by different mindsets or different cultural norms or different attitudes between uh, states. So we hope very much that the Secretary General's roadmap will be part of an effort to improve uh, humanity's uh, performance uh, in that regard to make our children safer. Um, with that, I'd now like to hand the floor 
to Mr. Andrew Sullivan, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Internet uh, Society. So, Andrew, uh, over to you. Thank you so much. Secretary General, Excellencies, distinguished moderator and panelists, friends and colleagues, if ever there was a time to appreciate all the benefits the internet brings and could bring, it is now. As other distinguished panelists have noted, even a few years ago, a gathering like this online would have been unthinkable. In the ongoing pandemic, millions of people have been able to work and to maintain their social bonds, no matter whether separated by distance or illness. The internet, too, is a means by which totally justified cries for racial justice are echoing around the world today. The internet is a deeply human technology built by people collaborating to make it so that people could collaborate better. More internet, more collaboration in a virtuous circle. That's the good news. But the bad news is not everybody has access, and therefore I welcome the way the Roadmap for Digital Cooperation emphasizes the need for connectivity. We at the Internet Society agree that it is an urgent need. It's something we work on every day, and we are keen to help. The world also needs to create and assert a common understanding of the importance of Internet infrastructure and how it can help all people. If we are to have any hope of listening to and hearing the voices of people who are today excluded, the first thing we need to do is to include them. Early in the days of the pandemic, some suggested that the internet's decentralized nature might make it incapable of dealing with the new demands. Instead, the internet design worked. It is the centralized, tightly controlled networks that have struggled. The internet way is to use simple building blocks and to make complex systems out of those blocks. Experience tells us this approach works very well. And so the internet way is the best way to connect us all so that we can learn from one another. Now, of course, the internet presents some challenges. It is too often used as a means to promote racial hate or false information or abuse or crime. But while admitting those challenges, we must keep in mind how well the architecture of the internet has proven itself and how people have benefited. And we must build on those strengths. This means understanding that the distributed decentralized design of the internet is what worked in the current health crisis. So we need to resist calls for centralization or regulations that are not fit for purpose. It means making sure that the people who want connectivity can be involved in building it so that it meets their needs. It means acknowledging that seemingly simple solutions to address one problem on the internet can create possibly worse effects elsewhere in this complex system. And it means ensuring secure connectivity for everyone because insecure systems for some means an insecure internet for us all. There are, as the roadmap notes, legitimate concerns underlying the need for encryption. Sometimes those concerns can only be addressed with strong end-to-end -end encryption. When pandemic came, the internet was ready. Many traditional governmental systems were, alas, not. And there is a lesson to be learned here, I believe, when thinking about the future of digital cooperation. The words of Kofi Annan, former UN General Secretary, shared 15 years ago, still resonate. In managing, promoting, and protecting the Internet's presence in our lives, we need to be no less creative than those who invented it. Clearly, there is a need for governance, but that does not necessarily mean that it has to be done in the traditional way for something that is so very different. Digital cooperation and ensuring that everyone is included in that cooperation is necessary so that all of humanity and not just a few can receive these human benefits. Let us make sure together that the internet is for everyone. Thank you and stay safe all. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew. And let me just uh, emphasize that that sentiment that we need to be as inventive and decentralized in our approaches to ensuring adequately adequate guardrails and adequate policy guidance um, for digital technologies 
as the technology itself is inventive and decentralized. And that is very much uh, along the same lines uh, uh, of thinking not only of the former Secretary General, but also of this um, Secretary General. Um, with that, um, we now come, um, we, the floor is now open for after those really stimulating opening remarks um, from uh, across different stakeholder groups, uh, leaders in different stakeholder groups. We now have the opportunity for interventions and, and questions from, from the audience. Um, some have already registered. If anybody would, would like to um, register, uh, please um, do so in, in the margins. My colleagues will be uh, looking at that space. Um, the first speaker we have is uh, the Minister of Digital Development, Innovation and Aerospace in Kazakhstan. Mr. Aska Zumagaliev, um, who is joining us live from Nur Sultan. Uh, I had uh, the, the, the honor of weeks ago. I think it was one of my last trips before COVID put an end to travel um, to visit Kazakhstan. And I was very impressed uh, just how advanced um, Kazakhstan is in securing um, connectivity and ensuring digital uh, literacy. So um, if I could hand the floor to you, uh, Mr. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Hochschild. Always welcome to uh, Kazakhstan, to Nur Sultan. Dear Secretary General, distinguished panelists, on behalf of the Republic of Kazakhstan, I am honored to have the opportunity to participate in today's discussion. Recent events related to the COVID-19 once again reminded us that we live in closely connected world. Only joint efforts will allow us to find a way out of this situation. The present condition demonstrated the importance of the digital by default approach. The projects implemented under the state program Digital Kazakhstan allowed us to adjust to new realities. First, Kazakhstan has one of the most affordable internet. 96% of the population is covered with mobile internet access. And we will reach 90-90% by the end of the 2020. The digital literacy rate is around 83%. 82% of public services are provided online to citizens. And we aim to reach 90% by the end of 2020. Second, during the pandemic, local IT companies created dozens of new IT solutions in education, healthcare, public services, and others. Doctors and teachers were exempted from fees for the internet. Civil servants were able to transfer to remote work. All initiatives became real by the support of country leadership. Now we see the importance of growing digital. Our further vision is in the development of AI, 5G, data and analytics, and many other aspects. Regarding the roadmap for digital cooperation, we support such initiatives as appointment of tech envoy, establishment of the advisory body on AI, and the Digital Public Goods Alliance. We are also pleased to see that the roadmap encourages multilateral digital partnerships. Moreover, one of the relevant examples of digital collaboration is the GIGA project. It has Kazakhstan's commitment of achieving sustainable development goals. We are ready to contribute to the implementation of the global connectivity principle. Nevertheless, many other landlocked developing countries still face a number of challenges in infrastructure and access to the digital technologies. It prevents LDACs to achieve the Agenda 2030. We underline the importance of the international cooperation in this regard. In conclusion, I would like to deeply thank Secretary General Mr. Gutierrez and Under Secretary General Mr. Hochschild for the opportunity to speak today. I wish us all efficient 
joint work to achieve sustainable and peaceful development in current challenging conditions. Thank you for your irritation. Stay safe. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. But, I mean... Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Minister. Oh, Sorry, could, could others go on mute, please, who are not, not speaking? Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Minister. Um, and we, we hope very much in Kazakhstan you, you are all safe too. Um, now um, we have 10 speakers who've registered and we have about half an hour. So if at all possible, if I could ask you um, with all due deference, um, if possible to keep your remarks to, to under three minutes, that would be um, really appreciated and allow us to have room for everyone to speak. And so with that, I'd like to uh, give the floor um, to uh, Ambassador Perks Ligoya. Um, uh, Ambassador Ligoya is the uh, permanent representative of Malawi and the chair uh, of the, of the least developed countries um, to make a statement on behalf of the least developed countries uh, group. Ambassador, the floor is, is yours. Thank you very much, Fabrizio. Uh, Excellencies, heads of state and government, honorable ministers, uh, Mr. Secretary General, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I have the honor to deliver these remarks on behalf of the 47 least developed countries. I thank the Secretary General for coming up with a roadmap on digital cooperation that highlights several challenges that the LDCs are facing. As highlighted in the roadmap, the LDCs are left furthest behind when it comes to internet use. In 2019, only 19 percent in the LDCs used the internet, compared to 87 percent of individuals in developed countries. COVID-19 has exposed the disadvantages that LDCs have been facing in carrying out online activities. During the lockdown period, advanced economies are using online platforms like these to undertake many of their daily activities. Similarly, digitalization has allowed remote learning for millions of students in these countries. However, ironically, LDCs are not able to avail online facilities, primarily due to insufficient broadband services. COVID-19 has created an emergency to promote digital access and broadband connectivity in LDCs to build a resilient society in the face of new and emerging challenges. Investing in LDCs makes business sense. Most LDCs have a burgeoning youth population who are growing at a rapid pace. This vibrant young population can be an important agent of social change in LDCs if they are provided with opportunities. Thus, the business opportunities are enormous in LDCs. In order to maximize these opportunities, there is need to increase broadband connectivity, affordable access, and productive multifaceted use, even in remote areas. High-speed broadband internet will offer greater potential for harnessing far-reaching development outcomes including reducing inequalities within and across countries. It is important to ensure that the metrics for measuring digital inclusiveness that are being developed incorporate the needs of LDCs. In addition, LDCs and other vulnerable countries should be involved in the developing of these metrics. Going forward, I suggest that we find a solution to the inadequate incentives for the telecom industries to invest in faster and cheaper internet in LDCs. As expressed by the High Representative of LDCs, uh, public funding alone is not enough as LDCs are poor. International support will be required to supplement our efforts. We will be pleased to continue this conversation, including in the context of the upcoming fifth UN conference on LDCs. This conference gives all stakeholders in this discussion an opportunity to contribute. It is ironical that the cost of connectivity in LDCs is by far more expensive 
than in developed countries. All our efforts will only be meaningful in LDCs if access is increased, infrastructure and security is enhanced, and cost of connectivity is reduced. Let us all work towards arresting the ever-growing digital divide and standing up to our mantra of leaving no one behind. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And I think uh, the impact we have to connect those most in need in LDCs is really the ultimate test of the validity of our roadmap, the ultimate measuring um, state. So we hope to continue working very, very closely with you and the LDC group. And now, if I could hand the floor to another very distinguished ambassador here in New York, the head of delegation of the European Union to the United Nations, His Excellency Ambassador Olof Skoug. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Fabrizio, and uh, dear colleagues, good morning or good, uh, good afternoon or good evening, where, depending on where you are. I have to say it was, uh, I mean, we know that the Secretary General has been leading the UN in a very, very effective way throughout this uh, crisis, but it was somehow extra reassuring to see him speak to us from his own office uh, this, this afternoon. Um, I want to say that, um, speaking on behalf of the European Union, that we are uh, very much behind um, the, the basic tenet behind this report um, um, uh, to protect the global good of the Internet, um, and to do that by providing access to all. And, uh, and also, uh, you know, if we can be helpful in providing a governance model that strikes the right balance between freedom of expression um, and respect for human rights, but also to protect from integrity breaches and exploitation, including of uh, children. Um, so um, we do see the need for global cooperation uh, just along the lines that uh, the Secretary General has set out in this uh, roadmap. I wanted to just spend 30 seconds to uh, inform you about the fact that the European Union Commission yesterday took a joint uh, communication on tackling um, the disinformation that has uh, surrounded the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and uh, the High Representative, Josep Borrell, said you know, that warriors wield keyboards rather than swords in this, in this fight we see how misinformation kills people and undermines democratic choices and societies. When we have worked to counter misleading information and debunk disinformation, including with our African partners, working with regional organizations, and we've also been very actively supporting and coordinating with the WHO in order to ensure that the facts and facts alone are the basis of how we deal with this pandemic. Um, we're also going to step up monitoring of freedom of media and, and violations of freedom of, uh, of expression uh, uh, now and, and moving forward. So I just wanted to um, also stress that part of the equation, the whole misinformation part, and, but really end by saying that we are ready to join others along the road uh, and the roadmap that you have uh, set out. So congratulations to the UN and thank you, Fabrizio, to you and your team for the work you've done in, in collecting this uh, very useful roadmap. Thank you very much. Those um, encouraging uh, words, Olof, um, and I think many countries do take as a reference point um, the balance Europe has managed to, to strike between um, regulation upholding uh, human rights and individual liberties um, and uh, freedom for innovation. Um, I'd now like to, to, to give um, the floor uh, to uh, uh, another very, very distinguished ambassador here, Ambassador Bulhan Gafour of, of Singapore. And of course, this is uh, uh, Singapore is a, a world-renowned leader in the digital era. Um, Ambassador uh, Gafour, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Fabricio, and my thanks also to the um, excellent panel of speakers for their very interesting and inspiring remarks. 
Let me start by saying that Singapore welcomes the launch of the roadmap and we endorse in particular all the points that the Secretary General made right at the outset of this meeting. In particular, we underscore our very strong support for the UN as a platform for dialogue in creating norms and rules to govern a digital uh, space, the, go the global digital space. And we also welcome many of the recommendations in the roadmap, including the appointment of a technology envoy and establishing a baseline of digital connectivity to narrow the digital divide. I wanted to very quickly make uh, three broad points. Um, first, as we go about implementing the recommendations in the roadmap, I think it's critical that we recognize that there is a diversity among member states and regions, and that our initiatives need to be adapted according to the varied contexts and needs of countries. Uh, for example, we should ensure that the uh, least developed countries and my friend uh, and the distinguished ambassador of Malawi was speaking on behalf of the LDCs just earlier, um, together with the six small island uh, states, developing uh, states, they need particular attention because ultimately the least developed countries and the most vulnerable countries are also the most disconnected or unconnected um, to the digital infrastructure. Um, and it is therefore important that the UN uh, network and the UN system working together with the stakeholders, including the private sector, uh, work together to help uh, countries uh, that will require the assistance. Uh, second, I would also like to endorse the importance of open source solutions, uh, which is a very important way of promoting uh, digital public goods. And we think that open source solutions can be deployed at a lower cost and at a faster pace than traditional software development. And this is particularly important for many, many developing countries where resources have become even more scarce in the context of the rebuilding and recovery from COVID. Um, and here too, I think there's a role for the UN working with uh, stakeholders like the private sector and other civil society actors can make a big uh, impact uh, in terms of open source uh, programs that are made available to member states. And the final point I wanted to say, uh, Fabrizio, is that all member states here at the UN need to engage with each other in order to implement the recommendations in the roadmap. And let us all be clear, it is no secret that we are all going through very challenging political times and there are deep political differences among countries around the table at the UN. But we need to work together to find and build convergences in order to implement some of the most important recommendations in the roadmap. And it also means that we need to reach out and broaden our outreach and talk to stakeholders, the private sector, academia, civil society, technology companies as well, in order to build trust uh, and build convergence around some of the most important things that needs to be done in order to implement the roadmap. Ultimately, I wanted to say that what we do digitally is essential to achieve the goals of Agenda 2030 and sustainable development. And therefore, failure is not an option. We have to not only build back better, we have to build back better digitally. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you also for the leadership you've exercised in this area in New York and your voice of, of reason and unity in times that, as you highlighted, are, are very, very polarized. Um, a, a, another person who has, a, from a country that has also exercised extraordinary leadership with regard to uh, integrating uh, transformative technologies uh, more into UN agendas in the uh, pursuit of the sustainable development goals is, of course, the uh, 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 ambassador of Mexico. Uh, Ambassador Juan Ramon de la Fuente, uh, and who has also played a pivotal role in, together with Singapore and Finland, um, setting up the Friends of Digital Technology, um, who are uh, 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 key for the leadership 
uh, here in New York in this area. So if I could hand the floor to you, uh, Ambassador Juan Ramon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabricio, colleagues and friends. I trust you're all safe and well. Uh, let me start by congratulating the Secretary General for launching the roadmap uh, on digital cooperation. It provides continuity and projects to the future the topic of exponential technological change that Mexico introduced in the work of the General Assembly in uh, 2018. In our perspective, this document brings not only a new approach and a wider scope to the UN, but above all, it provides a renewed commitment to improve people's lives through technologies. And I'm referring basically to those peoples that we urgently need to reach and who no longer are to be left behind because they lack affordable and meaningful connectivity. The figures contained in the roadmap are disturbing, particularly as one figures how essential digital technologies have become during the COVID-19 pandemic, as it has been said this afternoon. In developed countries, close to 90% of people uses the internet routinely. In contrast, in the least developing countries, less than 20% have access to it. We can no longer accept these gaps. Universal connectivity has become an imperative. We applaud the inclusion of migrants as part of the vulnerable groups that we need to reach. There's no basis to question the contribution they make to the countries where they live and the contributions they can make on our digital economies. We welcome as well the appointment of a technology envoy uh, and also the mapping exercises within the UN system. We trust that these initiatives will bring us closer to the more systemic approach we're yet to see at the UN in this subject. In sum, we commend the presentation of the Secretary General's Roadmap on Digital Cooperation. We support the approach of including relevant stakeholders because in the end, we all know there are limits to what governments can do by themselves. And this is a very good example. We also renew our commitment to strengthen the UN leadership role in this topic as we are talking about tools for a more inclusive development. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador, and thank you uh, for, your, for your continued leadership and support in this area. Um, I'd now like to give the floor to the Deputy Secretary General of um, the UN, uh, uh, UNCTAD, uh, my colleague Isabel uh, Dura. Isabel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, do you hear me? So, uh, thank you, Cher. Do you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Please go ahead. Okay, so most likely the critical role of digital technologies the last few months has and will have lasting effects. People and organizations will rely on digital solutions more than ever before. But as said uh, with all previous speeches, not all benefit equally. And as a UN organization dedicated to trade and socioeconomic aspects for development, I would like to share with you two figures illustrating the magnitude of the gap in this field. The first figure is about the economic value and benefit of digital economy. 90% is concentrated in China and US, and 10% for the rest of the world. It shows the, the, the magnitude of the gap. And the second figure is the increasing of gain of one of the biggest platforms, Amazon, 36 billion US dollars the last 11 weeks. 
during the confinement. In addition to this economic gap, the different levels of digital readiness underline the need for new policies and regulation. The need for effective digital cooperation has never been greater. And in the interest of making effective use of limited resources, avoiding duplication and enabling the scaling up of efforts in this area, it is crucial to make full use of existing mechanisms and platforms. UNCTAD offers a helping hand for digital cooperation. We can draw our expertise as the chair of the UN Group on the Information Society, a contributor to the WISIS Forum, and the Secretariat of the Commission of Science and Technology for Development, which is in meeting virtually this week with hundreds of participants. We also convened the UNCTAD e-commerce week and coordinated the e-trade for all initiative, which provides developing countries access to assistance from international and civil society organizations and builds up their readiness to engage in and benefit from digital trade. So let's leverage our joint expertise and capacity and connect the dots uh, in digital cooperation. The dots, connect the dots, but also connect respect and protection, what the, as the SG uh, Guterres mentioned very well. So I think that this roadmap is a very good opportunity to do that, and you can count on UNCTAD in this regard. Very much, and, and I, I should confess, we have a very gifted uh, UNCTAD staff member on our team, so we're very grateful for the support we're getting. Uh, as well as um, gifted staff members from other parts of the system, notably um, ITU, among others. Um, I now like to, we have about six more speakers. So I, if 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 you will forgive me for reiterating um, the plea to be to be brief as far as possible. Um, and the next speaker is um, Murat uh, Somne, the head of the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution of the World um, Economic Forum, speaking to us uh, from California. Uh, Murat. Thank you, Thank you Fabrizio. A uh, warm uh, greeting to everyone from the Bay Area. Technology is moving faster, much faster than we can fully understand its implications, potential benefit and harm. By the time we figure out its implications, uh, it's too late. The technology has moved on, but the bad actors are using that already. So we continue to find ourselves in operating what we call the too late zone. And our reactions are always backward looking and penalizing as opposed to forward looking and enabling. That's why the World Economic Forum launched the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution Global Network three years ago, more than three years ago, to ensure that the Fourth Industrial Revolution benefits everyone and not just a few. Our approach has been agile, has been forward looking, global, multi-stakeholder, and most importantly, inclusive and human-centered. A good example is our work with Rwanda. They became the first nation to have a forward-looking drone regulatory framework three years ago. They have the largest fleet of civilian drones in action in the world. They reduced their blood uh, loss rate uh, to zero. They reduced the delivery times to 80%, by 80%, saving thousands of lives. That little framework is now on its way to become a global de facto standard through our work with Gavi, Zipline, International Civil Aviation Organization. So it can be done, it has been done. And this is just one uh, example. Think of what we're doing as a think tank, uh, as a do tank, not a think tank, and as a technology governance accelerator. In the post-COVID-19 world, as many speakers mentioned, represents a great opportunity for a, a redesign, rethink, rebuild. We call it the Great Reset. We should not digitize what we have been doing, but look at what's available build on top of that so that these technologies benefit everybody, not just uh, a few. I'd like to give you a few examples in about 20 seconds. First of all, trust and, transparent, trust and transparency has to be embedded in everything we do, whether it's AI algorithms, facial recognition implementation, or any other use of technology. Blockchain represents a great opportunity. However, it's highly complex, expensive. We have launched our blockchain or supply chain toolkit with 18 online modules available for everyone with active participation of 100 companies and governments. The more than 100 ethical principles in AI need to be implemented. We have formed the Global AI Action Alliance to distill them to 12, and we're working with select governments and jurisdictions to implement them using a multi-stakeholder effort. Data policy is key, uh, and up until recently, data policy has been focused singular, singularly on privacy and protection. We need to move to a more common purpose oriented use of data enumerating the owners of data equitably. 
the forum welcomes the roadmap's emphasis on uh, all these points, and we look forward to our contribution to become a global amplifier and accelerator. And finally, I would recommend that we do not focus on unanimous consent, which will be politically very hard to achieve in today's world, but focus on interoperability, which we have seen many countries uh, emerging and large economies to be willing to work. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, the World Economic Forum has been at the forefront of, of thinking about the implications of the Fourth Industrial Revolution, and we're very grateful for the strong partnership uh, with you. I'd now like to um, hand the floor to the distinguished ambassador uh, in New York of the, of, the, of the Netherlands, the Deputy Permanent Representative, uh, Ambassador Mark Selenrad. Thank you, Fabrizio, and thanks also to your team for this launch and this excellent event. And thank you also to the Secretary General for sharing his vision on the launch of the roadmap. And I'll, I'll have to be frank with you, when I saw him speaking about the cyber domain, it, it gave me a bit of a flashback uh, to January of this year, and that almost seems like a, a lifetime ago. But then he spoke about 2020 and about the challenges that lay ahead for this year, and he called them the four horsemen in our midst. And one of those horsemen was taming the wild west of cyberspace. And when I listened to Baroness Shields, and she talked about the children and being the father of three and hero, hearing these harrowing uh, stories, certainly took me back to the responsibility that rests upon all of our shoulders in order to tame this Wild West and to promote the opportunities that it gives, which we also heard uh, a lot about, but certainly also count the threat. And you can rest assured that my country, the Netherlands, uh, will stand next to you to extend the international rule-based order into cyberspace and also where human rights are as real and as valid as they are in the physical world and where we will strengthen the digital cooperation and shape this shared future, the shared vision that you talked about in digital trust and security of which we are a champion. And we welcome your approach and your inclusive uh, method in which you are doing this, uh, Fabrizio. Let me uh, just highlight three points that we think are, are important in the way ahead. First of all, uh, to empower all the states to take part in this global, global debate on our common digital future. Uh, we are in Switzerland, we're in Sierra Leone, we're in the United Arab Emirates, and it's immediately clear that every country has its own unique approach, its own unique opportunities and its challenges, and only by getting together and sharing these experience, we can help each other moving forward. So let's use this platform, let's use this roadmap to help each other out. Secondly, uh, we need this alliance, we need this global roadmap as well to um, combine and connect the public and the private sector together. Too often it still seems that there are two separate worlds where the private sector is developing and operating and managing the, the infrastructure of the internet and the government's lagging behind, which is of course not true. Uh, the states are needed to ensure a safe, free, open and secure internet to educate our citizens uh, for responsible use of this internet to so also use this roadmap to bring these two worlds together and jointly tackle the challenges that have been discussed uh, in depth. Thirdly and lastly, it's the 75th birthday of the United Nation. Uh, the charter certainly uh, wasn't developed with Zoom in mind, but here we are. And I think, uh, again, uh, never waste a good crisis. Uh, let's put this digital future, this roadmap, front and center, uh, when in a high level week, we will discuss uh, the 75th birthday and the years ahead and put digital cooperation and a shared digital future at the top of the agenda of all heads and states of government that we'll uh, discuss probably virtually uh, in this debate. So uh, to prove, let's be ambitious. Let's be ambitious as possible. It's a responsibility, it's a shared future, it's a digital future. Uh, and you, we will stand next to you, uh, Fabrizio, as a champion on digital trust and security. And we look forward to working with all of you in the uh, months and years ahead on this report. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we very much salute and are inspired by the, the level of ambition um, and, and certainly share the sentiment the Secretary General does and has frequently said it, that in making the United Nations more forward-looking, um, positioning it, to uh, deal better with these issues in the decades to come is important and would be a very positive outcome of the UN 75 process. So thank you. 
I'd now like to um, uh, give the floor uh, to uh, another distinguished ambassador here, the Deputy Permanent Representative of the United Kingdom, uh, Ambassador uh, James Roscoe. James, the floor is yours. Many, many thanks, Fabrizio. And um, it's great to see the publication of the Secretary General's Roadmap for Digital Cooperation today. Um, I know that uh, for you and for many, this is the culmination of a huge amount of work. Um, and we're very grateful to all those involved. As you know, the UK has closely followed the work of this panel and colleagues from across our government have been pleased to contribute to several of the working groups, including that on digital public goods, human rights and digital cooperation. Um, it's a huge, achieve a huge achievement, but it's the beginning of a journey in many ways, um, and we're looking forward to going on it. Um, it's been great also to see the, the way that the UN has taken such a multi-stakeholder approach. Um, and this has been on display again here today. Uh, it's clear that digital cooperation requires genuine and inclusive engagement with all stakeholders. And we've heard today from the private sector, um, we've heard from civil society. Um, we really need to engage with these groups and doing so will make a real difference. Um, the other thing that's really struck me listening to contributors today has been how everyone has really um, focused on the impact of COVID-19 and the way that this pandemic has demonstrated that digital is not just an add-on, um, but instead underpins so much of what we do today. Um, certainly from our perspective, the tracing apps, the public health advice, uh, the research cooperation, uh, the support for businesses, and the need to assure communication and accurate communication information um, all require good digital infrastructure. Um, but we've also heard how many still do not have the benefit of these digital um, technologies. This crisis should refocus all of our attention on bridging, bridging the digital divide and connecting the unconnected. Uh, it's also worth reminding everyone that the UK is a strong supporter of the Internet Governance Forum, uh, and we welcome the widespread consensus around the IGF Plus model um, during the working group discussions. Um, we're really pleased to see actions in the roadmap to strengthen uh, the IGF. We also agree that human rights and fundamental freedoms apply fully in the digital world, and we welcome the initiatives being taken by the Human Rights Council in this regard. We should continue to raise the profile of human rights across digital cooperation efforts to encourage greater participation and engagement. The higher level panel and the roadmap have made a really valuable contribution in highlighting the critical role that digital plays in sustainable development too. And the UK looks forward to continuing to engage with all stakeholders in supporting the next steps um, in this work. Uh, finally, We've heard today from many of the speakers about the need to rebuild better in the wake of COVID. Digital technology needs to be at the heart of this effort. We need to embrace the vision of making access universal and ensuring the technology is an enabler of all those things in this institution that we hold dear, delivering the SDGs, enhancing human rights, and ultimately securing peace. Many thanks, Fabrizio. Thank you so much, um, James, for those for those um, encouraging words. Uh, we now have four speakers, so I'm afraid we will have to go over time. I'm, I'm, I apologize. Um, I, I would ask for your for your patience. And, and again, if I could implore the remaining speakers to be to be um, concise. Um, we first have um, from Kenya. Um, the Honourable uh, Director of the Ministry of, of Information and Communications and Technology, Mr. Hesbon uh, Malewi. Um, then we have the uh, permanent representative, the, the Ambassador of Egypt here in New York. Uh, we have the Technology Ambassador of Denmark. Uh, and we have uh, um, a, a distinguished representative of China. So um, with that, uh, let me go um, first to uh, Mr. Hesbon Malewi, who will be speaking to us from uh, Nairobi. Uh, Mr. Malewi, thank you, and thank you for joining us at such a late hour. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, 
Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, delegates, on behalf of the Republic of Kenya, I would like to assure the Secretary General of Kenya's full support and the cooperation in pursuit of roadmap for digital cooperation. Uh, we are all aware that the internet reaches billions of people uh, world over, uh, including Africa. And whereas this is desirable, it also has its own inherent technology challenges, and especially coping with new technologies and services continue to emerge, thereby creating new possibilities in the digital world. This is quickly re redefining new business models, a situation that could not have been predicted a generation ago. Uh, due to growth, Kenya is projecting on digital transformation in the economic sector. Consequently, Kenya has identified uh, five key pillars towards attaining digital economy. Uh, Secretary General, sir, this is only possible if there exists digital cooperation internationally and with all the stakeholders. This will ensure fair rules and regulations for the benefit of all across the digital divide. This is possible when open debates and regular reviews to ensure emerging issues are taken into account. Lastly, we see that COVID-19 has changed the lifestyle world over with more turning to technology to mitigate on emerging challenges. Digital technology is now on the increase uh, for school learning, telemedicine, business, and communication apps. This, more than anything else, reminds us how we are dependent on technology and hence the need for digital cooperation world over. Thank you, Thank you so much, um, sir. And, and of course, we're all very aware that much of the world can learn a, a great deal from what Kenya has achieved um, with regard to especially the digital economy, digital related um, jobs. So we very much welcome your, your active support to, to our efforts and your guidance along the way. Um, I'd now like to turn, I hope this will work, to the um, His Excellency, the, the permanent representative of Egypt. Um, Sarah, are you with us, Ambassador? Well, we might try and come back to um, Egypt, but I think we'll now um, uh, come turn to the um, uh, technology ambassador. And, and Denmark, of course, pioneered what has now become um, increasingly uh, uh, frequent, um, these uh, uh, ambassadors to the digital realm. Um, and the Denmark is already on their second, I think. Um, ambassador Mikael uh, Ikman, who, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is um, talking to us from San Francisco. Ambassador, over to you. Thank you very much, Fabricio. Um, I delivered uh, Denmark's general uh, remarks and welcomed the roadmap a little bit earlier today. So let me just zoom in on one question, which is particularly important to Denmark uh, in this work. And that's, of course, the question around how do we safeguard human rights in the midst of the digital transformation that have been put on steroids by COVID-19 as well. We really appreciate the way you handle this in the roadmap and in this work. And we see in particular three important elements in this. One is the question about digital inclusion and closing the digital divide. Leaving no one behind uh, is also key when we talk uh, about digitalization. Uh, COVID-19 has underlined that the world is moving potentially into an A or a B team in the digital sphere. Um, and this is not only about connectivity, uh, though that's a critical question, of course. This is also about skills, education, inclusion of women, girls, and young people around the world and the opportunities of digitalization. The second question, which is equally important, is that unfortunately we're seeing a rise of digital authoritarianism 
uh, at least that's what uh, uh, civil society has framed it around the world. In fact, we've seen a global internet freedom decline in nine years in a row. And this is also a question of as the next four billion uh, internet users come uh, online, what kind of internet will we experience collectively? Is it one that is uh, free, open and uh, secure and trustworthy, or is it something completely different? Uh, we strongly feel that um, uh, discrimination and surveillance uh, um, uh, must be met by uh, equally strong defense and exercise of human rights. And we are very happy with the strong emphasis on this in the uh, roadmap. And the last uh, element of this is uh, what you also highlight in the, in, in the text, which is that the data-driven business model and the very important role of the tech industry. You are very right, Fabricio that I am sitting here in, in Palo Alto, not that far from where Murad is. And, and as someone whose day job it is to engage with the tech industry and has done so for the past two, three, two, three years, I can say that at times it's a quite sobering uh, experience. Uh, some companies have been uh, extremely engaged and proactive and others have uh, become a little, have, have been a little bit more reserved in terms of having the dialogue on these tough questions. Uh, we've seen uh, good progress during COVID-19, but we need to see more action to fight disinformation and online harms, uh, not least directed at our children and young people, as Baroness uh, Shields uh, rightly pointed out uh, previously. So let me just finish by saying that in the spirit of uh, multi-stakeholderism that underpins this roadmap, uh, Denmark will certainly continue to push ahead together with you, uh, in the UN and our partners elsewhere to promote this human-centered and balanced approach to technology that has human rights at its uh, very core. You can count on Denmark in this regard. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and Denmark has been a key supporter and uh, inspiration to us, and we hope very much for continued close cooperation uh, as we move forward. Um, now, I think the final speaker, I don't think we've managed to get the Egyptian PR, unfortunately, but the final speaker is uh, the distinguished representative of China. Uh, the, floor is, the floor is yours, sir. Well, thank you, Fabius Rowe. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm honored to uh, take the floor as the uh, last speaker. I think today's uh, virtual meeting is quite successful. Uh, my delegation uh, thanks uh, the Secretariat, especially you and your team. Meaning it's uh, uh, launching uh, a role in the uh, to play a big role in uh, promoting digital. Currently, a lot of colleagues talk about the COVID 19 is still spreading worldwide. Uh, within this backdrop, the importance of uh, uh, global digital cooperation is increasing rather than decreasing. Uh, in terms of uh, the world economic recovery and uh, development, uh, online working, uh, medical treatment, education, e-commerce, etc., are uh, equipping uh, the new life and the working style, as well as opportunities uh, for humankind. And when we look at the uh, uh, eradicating insufficient and unbalanced development, uh, different countries uh, are faced with uh, poor digital uh, infrastructure and connectivity. Uh, the challenge of the digital uh, divide and technology, that technology gap uh, uh, widening. I fully echo um, the, uh, the previous state speakers, like uh, Ambassador from Malawi and Ambassador from uh, Singapore. Uh, those kind of uh, um, uh, tendency are causing a uh, new global inequality. Uh, China is of the view that uh, uh, digital cooperation relates to all aspects of the UN's work. Uh, UN is uh, in a better position to be more active on digital cooperation. Uh, I will touch uh, very shortly upon uh, three points. First, uh, I think 2020 marks the 75th uh, anniversary of the uh, founding of the UN. It is imperative to garner the uh, widest possible agreement of the membership uh, while making the digital cooperation a new tool for safeguarding multilateralism and enhancing the role of the United Nations. Second, the issue of uh, development shall be placed in a prioritized position in digital cooperation, and sustainable development shall remain its uh, main focus and direction, while the implementation of the 2030 Agenda is still its, uh, its core. Thirdly, in order to address the negative consequences of the COVID-19, 
and to achieve sustainable and inclusive recovery. Digital infrastructure, digital connectivity, digital inclusion shall be the main areas to be pushed forward. While the developing countries shall receive more capacity building assistance according to their own needs and priorities, and bridge the digital divide better integrate into global supply and value chains, and try to achieve the forward development. Uh, we are looking forward to working together with the other member states in the spirit of uh, building a shared future for humankind, conduct in-depth discussions on the contents and specific suggestions of the roadmap through the platform, such as Group of Brands on uh, Digital Corporation, so that concrete and positive outcomes can be achieved uh, in the future. With that, uh, thank you very much, Barbara. I wish you and your colleagues all the best in the future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you also for China's support throughout this. And, and, and now apparently we, did, we do manage um, to get one of New York's most articulate and eloquent and wise ambassadors uh, on the line. So I'm very glad that we have got the Egyptian PR, uh, Ambassador Ahmed Fati uh, Adris. Sir, the, the, the floor is yours. Uh, maybe I spoke too hastily, too hastily in hope. Do we have Egypt? Ambassador Idris? Well, I'm afraid this is like the commercial break in the Netflix series. You know, we'll have to keep the, uh, the, the suspense for next time. We'll start with Egypt. So we all have something to look forward to when we, we, we reconnect. Um, I'd like to thank you all for participating. I, I will say a few brief concluding words, but I won't try and sum up what was such a rich and useful uh, debate. I mean, many spoke of the background of COVID as a magnifier, an exacerbator, um, both of the upsides of connectivity uh, and the downsides uh, of it. Um, COVID-19 um, ha um, has been an unprecedented challenge um, for, for us as human beings, for our economies, uh, for the provision of social services, for our human interaction. It has been a very severe trial, but let's face it, without the benefit of digital technologies, it wouldn't have been a trial, it would have been an unmitigated catastrophe. Digital technologies, for those of us who have access to them, have quite literally uh, been life-saving. But that point shows just how painful and dangerous the absence is of access to those um, technologies. So I think the conclusion is inescapable as we talk about digital cooperation, that the first priority, and many speakers made this point, I think all speakers made this point, the first priority has to be universal connectivity. And the second priority of our work has to be universal connectivity. And dare I say it, the third priority for our work in digital cooperation has to be securing universal connectivity. But having said that, connectivity has to be affordable, it has to be meaningful, and it has to be safe. Digital technology has played a huge role in helping governments um, take safer measures to respond to the virus, in helping countries cooperate on cures and solutions and vaccines across the border, across borders, in promoting public health messages, in securing education, etc. But it has also uh, been, and many said that, the source of an incredible spread of dangerous misinformation. The point was also made against the context of what we're seeing in many parts of the world, that digital technology has been used um, creatively to promote action against racism. But let's face it, digital technologies have also uh, been used very effectively to promote xenophobia, racism, and hate speech at the same uh, time. 
So it is undoubtedly a huge benefit, but a benefit like previous technologies that needs to be managed as humanity has always managed new technologies to maximize the benefits while protecting the public um, good. Now, coming back to what we said was the first, second and third priority, universal connectivity. I think we have to recognize that having reached the first half of humanity, reaching the next half is a much harder struggle. Um, and one side of it is, of course, the infrastructure issue. But what I've learned uh, recently is that that's just a small part of it. I mean, the technology is there. The ability to, to, to build infrastructure um, to the extent it doesn't already exist to connect everybody is not such a difficult task. More difficult are the, some of the policy frameworks, the regulatory frameworks, and of course, having affordable um, financial structures and financial incentives um, as um, Malawi, um, uh, the ambassador from Malawi um, highlighted. So we need to look at this comprehensively. And of course, the challenges will differ um, from place to place. So there's no single recipe. And I think that was a point also the ambassador of Singapore highlighted that we need tailor-made um, solution. But it is a formidable undertaking. Today, uh, someone said that if things are left to drift on their own, we will not have universal connectivity before 2043 or 2045 at the very earliest. So it needs a much more concerted effort. We can't just rely on the drift of the many isolated, not all ways very well coordinated, not always to scale efforts that are already um, uh, going on. And above all, I think what we need to address all these challenges, universal connectivity and then safe, secure um, uh, access that is affordable and that puts human beings at the center, um, what we all need is, is unity of purpose. And of course, that's easy to say, but in, let's, as, as um, uh, Ambassador Gafour put it much more diplomatically than I will, um, in the current international climate, that unity of purpose is very hard um, to come by. Um, and it will take um, a, a, a very uh, serious um, effort. But we also have to face that all stand to lose if the internet becomes fragmented, as many see the current trends um, uh, taking us. Um, all, all lose if um, the digital divide isn't rapidly uh, overcome. So, you know, I hope that we can all work together to let common sense prevail, um, because everybody stands to gain if we overcome um, the divisions and recall unity of purpose. And let's also recall that some things, of course, countries define the acceptable limits to freedom of speech differently. Countries define acceptable surveillance measures differently. Cultures, countries define um, um, how their international human rights obligations should be held nationally differently. That, that is definitely true. There are definitely areas where there are divisions, but there are so many areas where people agree. I haven't heard anybody disagree about the desirability of uni universal, uh, uh, affordable access. I haven't heard anybody disagree that um, uh, universal connectivity is essential for sustainable um, development. I haven't heard anybody disagree that we don't want our children or grandchildren to be more threatened uh, and are less safe um, on the internet, or that we find um, racism or um, uh, harassment um, and discrimination against women um, acceptable. So there are elements where we can agree and where we should be able to work together. But we also have to recognize that it's going to be a long, hard struggle. It's going to be a marathon. It's not going to be a sprint. Um, in the current international environment, uh, it's not going to be easy. Um, and we need to work together. We need to work together across international borders. And we need to find where we agree 
where there's unity of purpose across international borders, but we also need to work together um, across um, different stakeholder groups. There were many points made that, um, that, that businesses sometimes went in one direction and, and governments um, in another, but I think we heard from the interventions today, if, um, if we hadn't um, said who was speaking and everybody had been asked just to guess from the content of their remarks who was talking at any one point, apart from the fact that business leaders uh, tend to be more gifted uh, at being concise than uh, UN officials like myself, I don't think it would have always been easy uh, to tell uh, who was speaking for which community. So there is a unity of purpose, and we need to build on that. So we hope very much we can continue uh, working um, together um, on uh, this long marathon, but a marathon that I think, if anyone is worth running, uh, this one um, is. Because what we stand to gain or what we stand to lose if we don't uh, progress together on this is, um, is really formidable. And COVID has magnified and highlighted that in, in a tragic and um, painful way. I would, before I shut, just like to say that we will be going into much more detail on individual recommendations um, in events that we're going to stage with many of the champions um, that, that helped us out in this exercise um, on Friday, that's tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken, um, and on, on Monday. And uh, we'd welcome you joining us for that. But I'd like to thank you all. I think the spirit that has been evident um, in this meeting of, of recognizing the shared objectives and just m how much is at stake um, in terms of um, achieving the sustainable development goals, in terms of securing a better planet for those who come after us, uh, how much is at stake, but how much unity there is. And I hope building on that, we can, we can really make a difference together, uh, a difference that uh, those who come after us will thank us for. So thank you so much, and I, I hope you all stay safe um, and, and stay connected, uh, and thank you so much for all joining us. So with all good wishes uh, and a very big thank you.